Good morning. There are so many of you here. This is exciting. Welcome to Convocation. Thank you for joining us for this special moment for the college and for all of you. Before we begin, it's important for us to make an acknowledgement. Montserrat College of Art would like to acknowledge the Naam Kiag people, as this was their ancestral lands until disease, war, slavery, and colonization displaced them from their homeland. The Naam Kiag people were part of the Massachusetts Alliance, or uh, the Massachusetts Alliance, and their descendants are now included in many tribal nations across the Northeast. We recognize our obligation to the land and to the indigenous people who care for it. As, they, as we work towards diversity, equity, and inclusion, we acknowledge our need to decolonize our systems, including indigenous people and their perspectives in our discourse, artistic education, academic, and leadership teams. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Brian Pellman, and I'm the Dean of Academic Affairs. For those of you who just went through orientation, I know we've already filled your heads with so many words of advice, and so many thoughts are probably already racing in your heads from the class you had this morning, or thinking about the ones you had, uh, the ones that you have left today. But I wanna ask you if you can just give us 30 more minutes, 30 more minutes of your brain space, and I promise we'll make it worthwhile. Besides graduation, this convocation is the one time of year that all of us, students, faculty, staff, are all in the same place at the same time. And this morning, I thought, as it's my tendency to do, I started to think about convocation from a cultural perspective. What is convocation? The word itself means to call together. And so why is it important for us to call together today? The reality is, the new school year started for all of us a long time ago. For faculty, maybe it began as soon as the spring classes ended and you started to think about what it is you're going to do in the fall ahead. For the new students, maybe your school year began when you accepted Montserrat and you decided to come here. For returning students, maybe the academic year started when you moved in earlier this week. But for us to all have a single time and place and a moment to say the new year has begun, is important, it's a ritual, it's symbolic. And as artists and designers, you already know the power of symbols, the way to communicate something that might be too complicated to express another way, or a way to communicate a context that lets the audience or the viewer know that there's something more going on. At Montserrat's convocation, at this ritual, there is a lot more going on. We are at the Cabot, and it's an appropriate place and it'll, because it'll also be the place where you graduate. You will all walk across the stage to receive your diploma during graduation ceremonies. For those of you on social media, I'm going to ask you to do something that you rarely get in moments of lectures and public uh, opportunities. I want you to take out your cameras and document this moment so you have a starting point when you think about your Montserrat education. I have my phone somewhere, too. I want a picture of all of you. Indian cultural critic Homi Baba talks about the idea that culture is invisible. It's actually far more complicated than that. There is in culture that thing that we're all participating in by our actions, by our recognition of symbols, our understanding of things that we think of as common sense. And we do these things, we follow these ideas often without even thinking. It just seems natural to us. And Baba thinks about and asks us to think about those invisible forces that are at work. So this convocation, like many rituals, gives us a moment to, to make some of those cultural ideas more visible. For all of us to show up here, for us to be in the same space after what we've all gone through for the last 18 or 19 difficult months, the idea of gathering together and being in person is something to celebrate. And so I hope this ritual is helping us with that. By all of us wearing our masks when we see each other on the street, even though we've all tested for COVID and tested negative, there is this symbolic act when we wear the mask that, we're, that we care for each other, that we're looking out for each other, that we care about each other's health. In a few minutes, we're going to hear about themes and ideas that will help us focus our community in the year ahead on a variety of goals. It seems to be the perfect thing to do at the start of the academic new year. 
The coming speakers will challenge you to question the everyday ways you've always gone about things and ask you to approach these things in a new way. I love that we commit to doing that together as a community. To me, that's incredibly powerful. Rituals are incredibly powerful, but only if we know why we do them. Convocation, then, is about drawing a line, making a mark. Let me close by doing just that. As the Dean of Academic Affairs, it is my job to declare this. The 2021-2022 Montserrat College of Art academic year has now officially begun, and it is my privilege to introduce and invite our college president, Dr. Kurt Steinberg, to give the welcome address. Thank you, everybody. And welcome to another exciting school year. And I think it's even more important to recognize, um, as I've said in many of my public comments, uh, that this is a transition semester, right? As we cross from what has been a uh, challenging uh, pandemic moment for all of us. We've had to change how we do things, how we learn, how we talk, how we are with each other, how we are with ourselves. And just for a second, acknowledge the fact that we're in a transitional semester, but I am excited to have us here. The fact that we are together in this building, even though we are masked, um, is an accomplishment is an incredible thing that we should take stock of for a moment if we get a chance, even though the last few days have been very, very busy for all of us. Just take a moment to sort of bring that in for a second. And while you think about that, before I start my, my remarks this morning, I think it's very important, and it actually goes along with my remarks this morning, um, I want to express some gratitude to a few people. Now, this is always a touchy thing because I will miss somebody who did something extraordinary and awesome and I apologize ahead of time for that. Um, but I wanted to make sure a few people were highlighted and a few groups of people. Well, first off, faculty, staff, and students, gratefulness from this president for all your hard work, not just this summer, but always, to preserve this community and preserve uh, what we do so well, which is educating the next generation of creative people. So. Thank you so much for dedicating yourself to that and rededicating yourself over and over again during what has been a very, very stressful time for all of us and continues to be. But a few highlights. So I'm going to do something that's probably going to make a few people uncomfortable, so you can decide to do it if you wish. It doesn't mean that you're not here, but any RAs or OLs that are here, could you stand for a second? I think you can hear the incredible gratitude from, from everybody for all the hard work that you guys have done, continue to do uh, for our community. Thank you so much. Student Affairs staff, Dean Maureen, Tanya, Mitchell, Cheryl, if you're here, and Elizabeth, a big thank you. Academic Affairs, Dean Bryan. Assistant Dean Stacy and Jesse, are here. Faculty Chairs, Aaron, Mark, and Ron. Faculty Meeting Chair, Ethan. And Faculty Representative of the Trustees, Patricia. And of course, I wanna say a big thank you to Meg and Colleen and the Academic Design Studio for all your hard work and all your continued work. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna also start to, add, uh, I think, uh, some thank yous uh, to some unsung heroes on campus. These, all the people I've talk, uh, talked about are in that category, but uh, you'll, you'll get it if uh, the staff will understand what I'm saying. I want Joanne, Teresa, Michelle, and Lori to please stand. A big thank you to Student Financial Services, Financial Aid, the Bursar, the Registrar, and Lori, who supports all three of them so capably. We thank you so much. 
we know we have this class in front of us and in no uh, small part to the fact that you work with them on an individual basis. Thank you. Everyone who helped with orientation, who I did not list, a big thank you to you as well. So we had our biggest facilities improvement summer, I think, ever, as far as I know, based on people I've talked to. We've had big and small projects undertaken and managed by an incredible team. If Jim could stand up, Bob, Jay, and a big thank you to Colbert and his cleaning team. <laughs> I want to tell you if, you, if you guys need anything in the spaces, please put in a ticket. Get your RAs to put in a ticket. These gentlemen cannot help you, cannot fix anything unless they know about it. And I can guarantee that they will hop on it. Heat and anything to do with water and plumbing go right up to the top of the list and they get dealt with. But they have to know about it. So please let them know. Let them uh, be of service, which they are so happy to be. And finally, someone that I don't, uh, I, I feel like we haven't thanked in public before, but I really feel like we should. A special thank you to a true unsung hero. We have worked hard over the last three years to improve our publications and overall design aesthetic in how the world sees us. And I am eternally grateful for our in-house designer, Serena. And if you could stand up, she's in the back. And we thank her for everything she does. So with that sense of gratefulness, of thanks in our, in our heads, I'm going to turn and twist a little bit to something that's related, but I think incredibly important for all of us to sort of think about. Selfishness plus impatience equals the absence of empathy. These are all symptoms of a greater problem. The pandemic has increased and accelerated a process that was already in motion. The detachment of the concept of the common good and to look out for your colleague, friend, family, neighbor, and less fortunate. We have in fact lost empathy for our fellow humans. We have allowed our selfishness and impatience to permeate our thoughts and actions. Who can bring the mindset and vocabulary of empathy back into the mainstream? I asked myself when I was writing this. And honestly, the answer is quite simple. Creative people. We have the power to communicate truth for our work and making. We have the power to give voice to the voiceless and to advocate for them in a way that no one else in our society is capable. I believe in the power of art and design education to my very core to transform the world and to fight tyranny. I believe what you are all embarking on this year needs to be the revival of empathy. It means that you bear witness to what are uncomfortable truths. You make these truths accessible to others and help the world heal, build empathy, and educate. I am, quite frankly, talking about the power of changing minds. The ability to increase understanding across a diverse group of people is something that creative people do naturally. Our community has been and continues to be resilient. Please continue to celebrate difference in yourselves and each other. Do not let the world dictate who you are or what you are becoming. You're constantly evolving. The Montserrat College of Art is changed by you, and it changes you. Let our collective voices rise up and be the change needed to make a better world. I will end with two of my favorite quotes. 
which a number of you have heard over and over again, but I think are so uh, poignant for our times. One is from our founding director, Joseph Jeswald, and the second from James Baldwin, a fearless witness to truth himself. Joseph Jeswald said, I would not choose convention or lie or try the comforts of silence. I would make a mark, a print, a stain, and so remain to bear witness by giving substance to my voice. And James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Creative people join together for the common good. You cannot get any more powerful than that. Speak up, speak loud, but most importantly, you must, it is not a choice, speak. Thank you very much and welcome the class of 2025 and welcome our community back to the hallowed halls of Montserrat College of Art. In the spirit of that, we have our speaker. I am so excited to have Dr. Leslie King Hammond here today. She has a life built on achievement, awards, and accomplishment longer than we have time for today. But I will tell you that she is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, two F words, fierce and a force. And you will get a little bit of that today. If I were to highlight any achievement that she has, she's Dean Emeritus from the Maryland Institute uh, for Graduate Studies. She has an incredible body of work, which a portion, a very small portion of that is going to be up in our library for an extended period of time. I really hope you get your way around it. In fact, I would insist that you do. But I will selfishly say that I am so excited about the fact that she was our class of 2021 commencement speaker. And the community conferred in May the degree of honorary doctor of fine arts. Dr. King Hammond is also a practicing artist creating mixed media for fiber works and installations that explore the global anonymity of women's work, domestic material culture, spirituality, and African religious retentions in the African diaspora. It is my great honor and privilege to ask to come to the stage Dr. Leslie King Hammond. we deal with the tradition of call and response. And when I was in my classrooms, even though I was the dean of the graduate school at Maryland Institute College of Art, otherwise known as MICA, um, I always encouraged the students, and after a while, I was sorry that I did because of the times that they disrupted all of my syllabi that I had wanted to share with them with their own urgent concerns. So, as I begin, let me again say that, and I'm gonna take off these glasses because I can't see. Once again, I am so honored to stand on <clears throat> the lands of the Namaki people and pay my respects and blessing to their ancestral spirits who I hope are looking down on us and conveying their blessings. Thank you, Montserrat College, President Kirk, Board of Trustees, the faculty, the staff, and especially Professor Ari Montford. He is my guardian angel, and he is a MICA alum. A special salute goes to the founders of Montserrat College of Art. 
and their visionary genius to create a very special and unique school where creativity works. The difference is, is that this school, which is a small school, is designed to give you each an individualized attention that you can't get in other schools. These nine founders, I know they were all men, but I grant you, there were some women in there pushing, nurturing, and nudging them to create this moment. It is worthy to note that Montserrat College of Art was founded in the mid-1960s. In history, this is called a pivotal moment. And it emerged in an era where it sort of began, not exactly in 1960, but in 1963, with the assassination of JFK. Then the arrivals of the Beatles, which set America particularly berserk. And then there was Bob Dylan, who ironically I met, or at least saw, when I went to a concert of Joan Baez in New York, where I was born, at the Forest Hills Stadium. And she introduced this young guy, this coming poet, this coming folk singer. And he sang a song called, The Times Are Changing, a poem that he had written. What was he talking about? He was talking about the presence of the civil rights movement, which was beginning to rage at that time. Bus rides, sit-ins, dogs, fire hoses. That decade closes out with the assassination of Martin Luther King. Everyone has a story. I'm here to hopefully give you some inspiration to fortify your dreams of a life full of creative creativity and artistry. But you don't know me, and I don't know you. So let's begin with a little short journey. I'm a child born into a Caribbean family from the Barbados Island. My mother was a registered nurse my father was trained as a master carpenter who went on to build battleships, aircraft carriers, and submarines in the Brooklyn Baby Yard. But it was my grandmother who was a needle technician. In the old days, they called them seamstresses, who could take scraps, abstracts of fiber and materials, put them together to make the most exquisite garments. I sat many hours next to her, watching this process, and fascinated with the idea of what making can do and become. So here I am, young child, living in America. One day I'm walking to school, and I look up at the traffic light, and my eye catches a poster on the lamppost. And I can't figure out, image-wise, I'm so fascinated with the image, I don't take time to read the text. But the light changes and I have to get to school. But all night, this image, this poster has dogged me. Well, obviously, I have become a very curious person. In other circumstances, just plain ass nosy. <laughs> so, the next day I get up and I walk to school quickly, making extra time so I can look at this poster and figure out what the hell am I looking at? What is driving my mind? And I stand there for a moment and I look at the poster and then all of a sudden, all of my childhood innocence pours out of every orifice in my body. I am looking at the open casket of Emmett Till, a young man just a few years older than me who had gone to Mississippi to spend the summer with his grandmother, was allegedly accused of whistling at a white woman, 
And then he was shot, beaten, mutilated, thrown in a body of war. His mother was so distraught that she allowed for her community in Chicago, where they lived, to create a poster and post around all the black communities in the United States. I was devastated. I was in probably the sixth grade. I went home, I never said a word to my parents. My parents never said a word to me. I was becoming very disillusioned with what the world was becoming. Then in a few years in middle school, I was made to read as an assignment the diary of Anne Frank. And I learned of all the horrific atrocities of the Nazi regime. I was through with humanity. I said, wrap it up. I'm going up space somewhere. I'm going to become an alien. This is not the world I want to live in. I'm out. Became very quiet. Family problems arise, because you know families are messy anyway. I knew I was a child locked in a situation. So I said, what can I do? I quickly discovered that my salvation became making art. So that when I was given time out, or I decided to take time out from the family, I went to my room and under my bed was a box, a cigar box, a Cuban cigar box, because my father in that day liked to smoke Cuban cigars when they were accessible. And in this box, I would have all my stuff, corks and threads and scissors and scraps my grandmother made me. And I would just make stuff. And I would be happy. I found solace in making stuff. And when my mother said, OK, you can come out now and be civil with the rest of the world, I said, I'm cool. I'm good. I'll be here in my room. I'll, be, I'll see you later for dinner. I'll set the table. OK. As I went on through this, I realized you can't make art about something you don't know anything about. In my research, in my work, in my travels, working with some of the greatest names in art history, Rome Bearden, Jacob Lawrence, they would say to me, you know, you have to be focused in the place where you come from. The reality was is that as I am accruing all of this experience, by the time I'm about 12, 13 years old, I figure, I don't want to be an archaeologist. I'm going to go in a pit somewhere, dig up the scraps of mankind, figure out how they put it together so I can understand that the people in ancient times live better than the people in the times that I'm living. So, went to the library, started to pull out books. Could not find any books about women, no. About African Americans, we were called Negroes then. Couldn't find any of those. Couldn't even find any books about Africa unless they were animals or trees and bushes or talking about primitives, which I certainly was not. So I started from the letter A and began to read all books in anthropology, archaeology, you name it, all the way up. And then when I got Frustrated, I went straight to science fiction because I said there got to be some alien forces somewhere around which I can model my life. Okay? But from studying ancient histories and science fiction, I saw how artists, writers, musicians, poets, dancers began to deal with the personal issues of crisis because I realized very young that crisis was going to be part of the experiences that I would have to deal with. So I learned about joy and love, and I read about work and death and life, and I worked, learned about the seasons and earth science and all the colors in the universe, performance, technology, and photography, and how they all came together. I was determined by that time to follow where my passion for art would leave me with no apologies. Well, by now you can imagine my parents think that I have lost my freaking mind. 
because I would not conform to whatever normal aspirations of a successful life would look like. They tried to make me take piano and culturize me, and I hated plunking on that instrument. I loved listening to the piano, but I didn't feel the flow. So finally, finally, they allowed me, my godfather, who was my teacher, piano teacher, he said, look, he was living in Brooklyn, it was a Brooklyn Museum Art School, and he said, let me, let me pay for her to go to art school because evidently she's not interested in anything else. So what do we learn from the moral of this very, very short, dense story? We learn that you are who you want to become as long as you face it. We learn, you should learn your family's history. Know who they are, know what their challenges are, know what their hopes and dreams were. Sit and listen to your elders. By knowing who you are, you can own it. When you own it, you empower yourself. The next thing while you are here, you are building relationships with your peers and your mentors. That is the staff, the faculty, the administration, and everyone in the city of Beverly and beyond. And this information will empower you so that you can solve challenges in today's very complex world. Living is a messy business. Healing is very hard. So, when you learn how to live a life through all of these things, by mediating and mitigating it through your art making, you live life to the fullest, and you not only survive, but you thrive. The final lesson that I would acknowledge is that please try to learn the most new, the most different, the most challenging information and engage people who are the opposite of who you are. Why? Because at the end of this experience, you want to form a posse. I don't function without a posse. When I got married the second time, this man came into my life, an architect, very nice man. He said, what do you want? I said, I don't need a director. I don't need a husband. I don't need anything, OK? But here's what I am. I come with a posse, and that's non-negotiable. So unless you accept my village, do you understand? You can't possibly begin to deal with me. Eventually, we got married. But he didn't marry me because of me. He married me because of my posse. He fell in love with them. OK? So now, you've heard so much this week. I'm sure your ears are just so tired of all these speeches. Let me share this one thing with you. I wasn't going to do it, but I am going to do it now. When I was invited to be the commencement speaker uh, for the graduating class of 2021, at the end of this wonderful ceremony on this gorgeous day at a beautiful yacht club, what jumps up on the stage but a big, giant, white rat? <laughs> Oversized. Now, I'm a black woman, and I see a white rat, huge, over life side, at an art school, and I'm going, OK. All things are possible. I've spent many decades at an art school, and I've seen everything walk across the stage. But I never saw a big ass white rat. Okay? Come to find out that the 2021 class of Montserrat College of Art decided to create their own mascot, the Monster Rat. So I said, OK, that's an odd, odd image. And that's a weird, weird ass mascot. <laughs> so I said, I have to do some lifting. And because I'm a nosy person, because I'm a curious person, and because I decided to take my life and move on and, and get a BFA in painting, and then an MA and a, B, a PhD in art history, I sort of confirmed this ability to, to address my nosiness. I just have to get into everything. My friends, my posse, the girls of Baltimore, that's the artist collective I belong to, they are always laughing at me because 
I'm always going back to the books and looking things up. So I want to give you some characteristics of the rat. <laughs> Powerful, okay? I would say that the Chinese, because I've done a global search, had the best luck on the rat. So when the Chinese New Year comes around and they designate which animal it will be and the rat comes around, remember, it's you all. <laughs> you are supposed to be individuals who are born under the sign of charm. You are supposed to be intelligent, popular, and you love to party. But let's not take it to the extreme. Remember, stay on focus, stay in your lane. And you love to have large social gatherings and parties. You're good at understanding human nature. And this goes back to your founders who wanted to prepare you for this role at this time in this history. You are hard and diligent workers. You are insightful. You have quick reflexes. And you adapt to different environments. You're good at making friends. So remember, this is a small group. Make sure that when you walk across the stage at graduation, you have met all of the students who entered at this time with your class. You too have the same disease as I. You're nosy. <laughs> You're eager for knowledge. The other thing is, is that like elephants, you have outstanding memories. You forget nothing. Good, bad, or indifferent, but make sure, keep it in context. You're affectionate, you're sentimental, you're a little bit introverted, but you are certainly passionate. Remember, don't ever forget your rain boots, your backs, or your masks. Stay safe and protect each other. You are also born under the five elements, wood, water, metal, earth, fire, as well as the various gender fluidities, whichever you subscribe to. I'm going to end at this moment, as we always do, with wisdom from the elders. Falling or failing teaches us to walk, to think, to focus. So don't get frustrated. Use it as a learning curve. To do nothing about things that you know are wrong is how we promote evil. Who teaches us is the giver of eyes. Not just these eyes, but the eyes here, 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 and touch, as well as the heart. And finally, to the staff and to the faculty, I want the students to understand that better than a thousand classes of study and hours is one good day with a great teacher. This class of 21-22, remember, we are in a time where we did not take good care of ourselves. We did not take good care of each other. We did not take good care of the planet. The school was founded to make you all agents of change. You are here. This is a beautiful, robust class of students. I don't know you yet. I hope that I will. I hope that you will learn something of me with my exhibition and some of my publications in the library. And with that, I wish you a wonderful, wonderful year. Thank you so much. We have a little surprise for Dr. Leslie King Hammond.
Well, first off, so I don't drop this, we give you a box. It has engraved on it the Hardy Building. Oh. We give this to special people, which you are a thank special you. person to us. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. But I also have, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the House of Representatives, be it hereby known to all that, the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Les Dr. Leslie King Hammond in recognition of your lifelong dedication to social justice activism and fighting to build a fairer and more equitable society. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. Given this first day of September 2021 at the State House, Boston, Massachusetts, signed Ronald Mariano, Speaker of the House, and Jerry Paracella, State Representative, Beverly, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank And to send you on your way, I give you Dean Brian Pellinen. We live in very complicated times, socially, politically, economically. And yet as we begin this new year, I am hopeful that our society can make progress, that I can make progress. But I'm reminded that hope is not the same as optimism. Optimism is less active. Hope requires work and effort and a willingness to learn and change our minds and try again. As you start this new academic year, be hopeful. As we end, I'm also reminded that we cannot be artists, designers, scholars, students, staff, professors without food. As you leave this convocation, um, you'll leave the, the Cabot Cinema and down the street at 301 Cabot for our new students, just follow the crowd. Uh, we have a, a sack lunch for you that has juice and yogurt and bagels and bananas and will keep you healthy and fueled for the day. Um, and hopefully what will be an extraordinary year. Thank you, Dr. King Hammond. Thank you, President Kurt. And thank you all for being part of this amazing Montserrat experience and for keeping all of us safe and healthy. Enjoy the semester.